On this episode of Survival Dispatch News, we're going to talk about grid down scenarios and alternative energy solutions to keep the lights on. This Survival Dispatch video is brought to you by Victos Tactical Apparel, creating innovative tactical gear for combat, training, everyday carry, and r and And we're back with Survival Dispatch News, and we have a really pertinent topic to discuss here for the prepper community, and that is a grid down scenario. But before we get into that, if you're watching this video and you want to get prepared for a grid down scenario, make sure you smash that like and subscribe button. Click the bell icon next to it to get notified every time we upload new content here on Survival Dispatch. But we have a great panel today uh, for, with some real experts in their field. Now, of course, I've got my lovely co-host, the Dean of Demolition, Mike Sterling, as always. And we have two amazing gentlemen from Sunder Energy. We've got the CEO, Max Britton, and we've got uh, Chris Manizzi, uh here to join and uh, share their experience and understanding of solar. I know they have a lot. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Very excited about this. No, it's going to be a great recording. So let's talk about a grid down scenario here because there's a lot of talk right now going around in the media with, you know, people saying that there's going to be maybe cyber attacks if anything happens in Taiwan. Of course, the, the Black Swan event is an EMP. But even if we just get down to basics for survival, think about like a natural disaster. We just had a tornado that ran through here in my part of Indiana a couple of weeks ago, took out the power for a good eight hours. Now, that's not a big deal, but what if it had been eight days? Uh, and of course, uh, Mike being down and uh, and Chris as well being there in, tor or not tornado, hurricane country, uh, yeah. you obviously have to worry about that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, guys, I want to get your input. What are some things that preppers should kind of think about when they're looking at a grid down scenario? Uh, Max, let's start with you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's probably, you know, one of the I would say top 10, maybe top five most important like things to have lined up, of course, water, food, shelter, protection. But if you're going to be bugging in, right, as opposed to bugging out, going out somewhere rural, you're likely going to need or want some electricity, whether it's to charge devices so you can stay in touch or maybe keep food cold. Or if you have a pretty good setup, then maybe keep the home cold or warm in, in extreme conditions. So it's, it's, in my opinion, one of the most important things you can do. And you mentioned the EMP, uh, you know, problem, of course, you could put your whole house in a Faraday cage or something, you know, if that happens. <laughs> again. But uh, you, it's an, a pretty important part, I think, of getting ready for the what ifs of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Give me your input. No, no, absolutely. I stipulate with Mac, you know, Mac's having storage, you know, being able to communicate with the outside, needing some electric, some food. Uh, so things like that. We And we definitely, you know, could help with that for sure. And uh something that's needed. No, we're definitely interested in hearing about your solutions here later in the video. Uh, Mike, obviously you've been overseas a lot and, uh, you know, there's definitely places that don't have the grid there. Uh, how do you see, you know, people in those parts of the world dealing with a lack of electricity? Well, um, <laughs> let's get into this appropriately. So, um, the the bottom line of the entire situation is that you know the vast majority of the of the developing world does not have an electrical grid. Period. Um, the power is dirty. Mm. Um, it's Friday, so uh, the power is dirty, and and honestly, the you have to you have to prioritize what it is that you're going to what it is that you're going to power. Um, you know when we're when we're in tornado season here. You know, and our power goes out for a couple of days. The primary, the primary thing that we that we look at, of course, is is you know I'll have a lot of neighbors that are out of town and they they need their freezers and refrigerators to keep on going. Okay, I'll go over there and I'll run their refrigerator and freezer for four hours a day on on my generator just to keep them up and running. Um, but the biggest, honestly, I would say probably the biggest issue that we actually run into is refrigeration of meds. You know, you get a lot, you get a lot of meds, and and we ran into this heavily in Africa. Wow where um where yeah we had to prioritize our power based upon liquid meds that our that our medics needed to run so um uh, now of course uh you know you 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 got to deal with that but at the same time in in you know the EOD operations that I do around the world there's several sites especially if they're US territory sites uh like out of the Marianas and 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 the like out in the Pacific Islands where you're not allowed to bring gasoline powered or petroleum powered 
generators with you. You have to run wind and solar powered power systems. So you really have to look at what it is that you're going to prioritize on the on on that basis. Now, granted, the vast majority of us really don't need a whole hell of a lot of power. It's not like there's cell service out on those little islands out in the Pacific in the first place. But you got to keep that sat phone up. You got to keep the computers up and running. You got to, you know, if you got a little bit of, of food that, you know, you're going to try and refrigerate, you've got to prioritize all these sort of things. And uh, there's, there's several good options out there. There's no great option, but there are some good options. And, and honestly, uh, it, private industry is is light years ahead of all these things that the government is trying to trying to do and so many times they the government the government contract contract teams they'll try and put you into a box and then we show up with something that just absolutely knocks the hell out of whatever the government contract team wants and you know they said they they don't know what to do because we've showed up with something that just beats them to death which is a beautiful thing no, it, it's a really good point. The The medicine aspect of it, I hadn't even considered for a second. But yeah, if you have like insulin or, uh, you know, other liquid medication that you need to keep cold, making sure that you have a contingency plan other than just, well, I'll stick some ice in the cooler and hope for the best uh, is probably, you know, pertinent in your preparation plans. And so, uh, you know, obviously we've got the solar experts here. So let's talk solar. Uh, of course, you know, everybody starts off with the, you know, the little solar panel that they're going to stick on their backpack, but that's not going to power the refrigerator. Uh, so how much solar energy do people really need for a situation like this? I'm sure you guys get asked this all the time. So give us your insights on this. Yeah, it, it of course, the easy answer is it varies, right? By need and size of home. And if you're doing just the bare essentials, a fridge and powering your cell phone or things like that, then it's a much smaller system. Uh, then, of course, there's the more expensive, a little more elaborate, larger system. You can do a whole home backup system. You can. Yeah, that technology has come a long way. It's not super cheap, but it's cheaper than it's ever been, to be honest. It's more affordable now. But uh, we usually measure this in kilowatts, you know, a thousand watts. You know, an average home to keep a refrigerator cold and power a battery that can keep the electricity going at night. You might need four kilowatts which is anywhere between 10 to 12 panels now. And of course, those have to be in a spot where they're going to be get hit by the sun all day. So they can't be under trees. They've got to hopefully be on your roof because then it's easy to get the electricity to your house. Uh, but it, it is more affordable than it's ever been and more accessible because like Mike was saying, the private sector has taken some of these government incentives and just private sector money to really step up the R&D on all of this. There's more battery options than there's ever been. There's more panel options. And a lot of that is coming to the domestic stateside production as well, which has really brought costs down uh, in a big way, to be honest. So a lot, a lot of good options for sure. Yeah, I would agree with, with exactly what you said. Um, you know, here in Florida, we average about 10 kilowatts per home, 10.52 to be exact. You know, I, I study the numbers. Um, who's counting? So t yeah. So the last uh, 16 months, our average install was 10.59 kilowatts. And that could be a home that has, you know, $150 electric bill up to like $300, you know, uh, give or take. But that's the average. And that's an installed average. So those are actually completed deals. Um, and generally it's it's a no-brainer for the customer you know they stop paying the utility and they start paying us you know or or the company mm -hmm. you know and uh you know when i met my wife and i told her what i did she kind of like gave me this weird like oh you know she's a constitutional uh, law paralegal and uh oh she'd fit in i said it's like year. oh yeah no she 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 loves to file this bad she's a she'll we'll get her on one day awesome you know, oh, yeah. you know, boys pee in the boys' room, girls pee in the girls' room. You know, really, you know, don't Radical even get me started. Let me stop. Radical yeah, let me stop. Right? Okay. Just madness. Yeah. Madness, you yeah. speak. Yeah. Uh, you okay. know, you were talking about, uh, you know, how when you get these solar systems, sometimes you can plug them back <laughs> into the grid. And then, you know, Max was talking about battery systems. Now, is there a difference between those two or are they, can they be the same thing? They work hand in hand. Uh, they absolutely are all connected. So, I'll just give you a quick example. Let's say 
the pow the power's on. The grid is up. Everything's running fine, and it's noon. Your panels are getting hit by that sun, and maybe you're at work. You're not home, and so the the panels are producing more electricity than your empty home needs because you don't have a bunch of stuff on. So the extra electricity that your home is creating but not using gets fed back into the grid. This whole system, this whole policy is called net metering, measuring the net flow to and from the home. And every time you send a kilowatt or a you know, bit of electricity back into the grid for the utility company to then turn around and sell to your neighbors, you get credit for that. And so you're able to pull electricity from the grid, from the utility company in the evening or on really hot days when the sun is down and the panels aren't producing, you still get credit for what you contributed that day. So that all happens and can coexist with a battery backup as well. And what will usually happen is the batteries are hooked up to the side of the house and they're, they're attached there and they will fill up first. And this doesn't have to happen a lot, right? You know, they, they fill up and if they're full, then that first system I just talked about, that's what takes precedent. The, the, the batteries are full, the panels produce excess, it goes into the grid, you get credit. And now you have the grid to give you electricity at night for, for free if you want. And then if the grid does go down and there's nothing going on, then you've got your batteries. And the nice thing that is a fairly recent development is most people, probably a lot of your viewers live in cities, homes, right? That are connected True. to the grid. We don't all have the bunker in the rural Montana, you know, who knows where, uh, but you're able to have a battery system that participates with the net metering policy where when the grid goes down, your home will still get electricity. Five years ago, when the grid went down, there was an automatic shutoff. The panels would turn off too. And that's no longer always the case. The batteries can kick in, keep everything going. And then if the grid is out still the next day because of craziness, the panels will produce, your batteries will recharge, and you'll be ready to go for hopefully another 24-hour cycle, assuming you're not using more than you're creating. So those three minutes of a lot, hopefully that's understandable. But that's it's perfect. Good. <clears throat> No, that, that really sheds some light on the situation, right? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, I, perfect. What I was going to say earlier when we were talking about, for a lot, I went in that rabbit hole, you know, have, having solar on your homes, like when I was at the restaurant with my wife telling her what I do, we're at Outback with the $30 steak that was cooked terrible. I'm like, it would be like me going across the street to Costco, buying a $99 grill and buying a five pack of steaks for $28 and cooking them clean, making them nice, and getting value. So what you're doing is, instead of just paying money to the utility, to the, the monopoly, you're taking that money, you're redirecting it back into a savings program for your home by buying your own equipment. So instead of the line coming out of the ground from the Dirty Brown Utility, it's coming off the roof from your fresh, clean solar. And that's kind of like making your own steak at home as opposed to having a steak at Outback that's been on a grill you know, that's had, you know, fries on it and spare ribs on it and cooked everything. It's not fresh, it's not clean, and it's not cost effective. So that was the comparison I made to her. And that's a comparison I make to a lot of people. People think they get solar and they're going to have like two bills. Like I got to pay off the solar, then I can start getting rid of electric. It doesn't work like that. It's like a transfer. So um, that's what we do. And that's kind of how it works, you know, along with the three minutes of uh, fame that Max gave you, which is all very true. You know, that's the sizzle and then you have the steak. <laughs> oh no, it's uh, always good. And Go I, ahead, I, I, I wish it was super easy to be able to, uh, uh, to be able to do that grid hookup. It's getting easier. Uh, I remember when that finally clicked over here, I'm actually in the Tennessee river Valley. So we fall under okay. the TV. We fall under the monopoly of the TVA. Yep. And mm. if, if you're not familiar with that, that is a that is an organization that is quasi government and it all came together during the New Deal. Mm. And there is if you look at it now, there is no way you could legally have a government organization like that because wow. it's part government, part private. It actually it's a government organization that pulls a profit and it's like, oh, dude, oh, yeah. Like with shareholders? And stuff like it, that. With shareholders. Oh. Yeah. But it's Even also better. part of the government. Oh, dude, the TVA is is crazy. They were the very last ones to get on board with the federal mandates for for alternate energy uh, uh, grid ties. And at oh yeah, it's it's been something. They'll do it now. The and and the reality of the situation is the power is really cheap here. 
it's all geo it's all uh it's all hydroelectric here it's cheap power however because of the way things are in this area with you know natural disasters and stuff we lose power on a fairly regular basis okay i get it um but yeah it's not always easy everywhere in the country um and and i wish it was i really wish it was but you're dealing with several hundred different entity power company entities and every one of them is going to be different just so just so everybody on the outside understands that it's not one set of rules for everybody else it it would be mm. nice but it's not amen very well said every little utility is their own kingdom and they sort of run it <laughs> like a kingdom sometimes and it's unfortunate you'll have neighborhoods two zip codes apart solar is embraced and awesome and great over here and over here it's like practically banned and it's it is tough you know for uh, homeowners to have to deal with that because you, you sort of have to move or lobby your government entities, which is always good luck with that. So you're, you're right. This is not one size fits all for all 50 states right now. You're right. Well, and, and out on the West Coast, you know, and I've got a, I've got a top up for this. Right. Um, out on the West Coast, I've got a buddy out there who they bought a house and the house came with, you know, a, a good solid quantity of solar panel built onto it, brand new. And um, they had no choice in the matter. Uh, it is, it is completely set. They are not allowed to have a battery bank in the system. The, no, wow. the solar goes directly into the grid and that's it. Wow. And if the grid goes down, their house draws from that power, but only during, only during the sunlight hours. It, it's, it's one of the most ridiculous things ever, but you know, that's the California power <laughs> grid for you in a in a nutshell um but yeah, but it's completely it's completely banned to be able to have a power system in there i was like i don't know about you but i'd be plugging something in yeah um, yeah down in it sounds like we just play some sopranos music in the background <laughs> for that story oh, you know uh, mike I, I think you mis mispronounced <laughs> California there i think you might have been you know, hitting the coffee yeah. a little too hard uh, but, uh, you know it's yeah. friday Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so what are so I, I had a question, you know, you're kind of talking about, you know, dealing with homeowners associations, government entities, things like that. What if there's like a conflict? So like, let's say that the HOA says, no, you can't have solar panels here, but the state law actually says that you can. Do you guys kind of help deal with that? Or like, how would you handle that situation? Yeah, we do run interference on the homeowner's behalf. And and again, the answer varies. Like some homeowners associations, you know, bylaws and documents are incredibly restrictive. And even if they allow solar, the, it'll, it's only allowed on the back of the house to, you know, preserve the beauty of the neighborhood and whatever. I'm not judging any decisions, but it is tricky. It is tricky for sure. And all these HOAs, all the cities, the counties, uh, the nice thing is, you know, there, there's two main ways you can go solar. You could like find a website, buy the panels hire an electrician or learn it yourself and figure it all out and you can deal with all that and of course honestly you'd probably save some money but some of that extra cost that goes into utilizing a you know a third party private company is the ability to have the i understand what panels i'm getting how many where they're going to be the expected electricity output i'm in sign my name and then we companies like ours take care of the rest we take point on everything else we get everything going we, we keep you updated as things are going with the city, the county, HOA, and we get all the permits for you. And then we just schedule a time to come put the panels on the roof once we have all the clearances. And that that varies. I've seen that happen in three days. I've seen that take six months in some really backwards parts of the country when it comes to you know this energy policy. Uh, and I'll, I'll remind everybody watching, solar is a very young industry. It is. You know, when you compare it to some of the other things going on or businesses in the world, uh, it's still very young. It's still what it's going to look like in 10 or 20 years is not what it looks like today. And so we're still figuring things out as far as regulations and all that. And there's some that are a little overstepping for sure. Surprise. Uh, but we're, we're, we're tr trying hard to change things to make it as good as possible for the homeowner as quick as possible. <clears throat> Well, and the quantity of the quantity of kilowatts per square inch that you guys are drawing now, as opposed to what it was twenty years ago, is light years different. 
It is amazing how different yeah. it is. I mean, I actually got to the point. I've got a I've got a camper trailer that's part of my part of my bug out plan, and of course, so very many camper trailers come these days solar ready, which is an outright lie because there's just two wires going from the plug straight to the battery. There was no fuse and there was no charge controller. And when I asked well, the guys about, about a charge controller, they didn't even know what a charge controller was. I said, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's a good, I mean, that is one good thing. Charge controllers are super cheap these days. So threw a 30 amp charge controller on there for what? 20 bucks, something like that. Great. And was done with it. Call it a day. But yeah, I mean it, and it it really helps. I'll just throw out the throw out a two hundred watt panel and just keep everything topped up all the time. That's so cool. Yeah, you you know, for people to have that knowledge level and know what a charge controller is, you know, life's a lot simpler and cheaper for sure, more affordable. I, I love that. So, uh, Chris, obviously, you're dealing with uh, installs and things like that quite a bit. Other than the cost, what is like an objection a lot of people have uh, to solar that you kind of have to deal with? I, I think there's a lot of things that people worry about. What are some of those that, uh, you know, maybe you can help allay some fears uh, for people who are watching? Um, the, the first thing is, you know, i am been in sales a long time. So I try to think of the customer's objection from a psychological standpoint. So I look at like an abusive relationship, right? So the first thing customers don't believe that someone could just come to their home and rescue them from an abusive relationship from the utility. Wait, so you're going to tell me what my price is going to be till the day that it's over. There's going to be no surprises, whether it's Democrat, Republican, stock market up, stock market down. You're going to give me price certainty. There's not going to be an electric bill taped to my coffin 30 days after I'm gone. No. So that's the first thing is getting them to believe, in fact, that it's really not too good to be true. And then getting them to understand that, no, it's not like two bills. Like, so, you know, my wife has a, a Ford Expedition. I wouldn't put a supercharger on top of it because we don't need it. Right. It's like, Why not? but if she needed a new fuel, well, that's something, I'm getting to a point here, sir. Okay. My bad. So, <laughs> But if it you wouldn't because the engine's going to blow up. <laughs> or I wouldn't spend the extra money. People think that solar is like a value add on top of their regular electric, right? No, this is going to replace what you're doing with a concept and price certainty and a finish line and a fixed payment or a payment that escalates very small over a period. So the biggest problem I have, because, you know, who do you have? What, how hard is it to sell free savings from the sun? Is people believing it, right? Because they're coming out of something so disgusting as, as what the monopolies and what the TVA has done to them. That's the biggest thing is paying is playing sales psychologist. So it's not hard to sell the savings. It's hard to get them to believe it's not too good to be true, and it's really going to be what I say it is. Um, and and that's just what the job is, you know. And I'm I'm over the state of Florida. I have you know people in other states, but. You know, I've been, uh, this is my 10th year here in the state of Florida doing solar. I haven't left. But I know the lay of the land very well. And I have, you know, thousands of customers that I've been involved with in some way. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not as hard as people make it to be, but, but they really don't know. So information and understanding is really what is what we need to do. Hope that wasn't a long-winded answer, but that's no, the thing. It's, it's not like, hey, do you want to save some money? No, let me think about it. No. How? Why would I save money now when I've been paying a 9%, 10% escalation, 28% in Cape Cod last year? People woke up overnight, your $400 electric bill was now, you know, uh, $620. They didn't ask you. They didn't let you vote on it. You didn't get to go to a town meeting. They didn't say, hey, stock up on groceries because we're going to strip it out of your checking account the following month. No, they just did it. So really the emotional trauma from the utility or from the process is what I deal with a lot, you know, in my point. And that's what, you know, I'll continue to deal with. That's I expect that every day, you know, because people don't know. And that's our yeah. job to tell them. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously with everything's going up these days with inflation uh, and, you know, prices just going up, you look at the price of the pump. I don't know what you guys are paying, but it's already spiked up to almost $4 a gallon here in Indiana. 
uh, you know, obviously people are kind of freaked out uh, with everything going on. Of course, the utility bills are not changing, uh, you know, as far as not going up. That never changes, right? Uh, but it is definitely a concern that makes a lot of sense that, you know, people may have had issues with that. And of course, we always hear the horror stories, right, about like, oh, you know, this company or that company did this terrible install. And so now you've you've jaded yourself against, you know, solar or, or alternative energy in general. And you're like, this is the only option I have. And I think that it's kind of important to recognize that there's always another option. As a prepper, you should be thinking about what your, you know, alternative escape, uh, you know, route is. When you are concealed carrying and you're going into a location, where are my escape routes? Where are my danger points? These are things as preppers we should be thinking about. Completely agree. Yeah, I mean, we, as Mike, you recall from the military, I mean, two is one and one is none, right? There yep. are options for sure. You know, it, it is a young industry, but it's growing fast. And then having two ways to get electricity is is so far and above beyond just the one. And, you know, we're not the only company. We're kicking butt. We're doing good. We're in 30 states. Everything's going well. But yeah, make sure you find something that's that's great for your location, even if it's not with us. I think it's a really smart thing to do. Yeah, I mean, you look at weird, weird things are going on. I mean, we've got a hurricane that's going to hit California in the next couple of days for the first time in 80 years. Like, they're going to lose power for sure. I don't know for oh, how long, but like those kind of weird things are going to continue to happen. And our society is so freaking dependent on electricity I think we don't think about it or talk about it much enough, to be honest. And we're just a couple of weird weeks away from scenarios probably all your, all these viewers and all of you have thought about. Uh, and I, I think having some electricity can go a long way to keeping some stability for you and the, the people you care about, for sure. It's a really good we, point. Oh, yeah, Chris. We can also buddy. look at it from another way. Also, saving money by having solar to prepare yourself financially to buy the things you need for when that time arrives so not only having the electric then but also monetarily getting yourself some savings and some some financial relief to help fund the other things you need to do for when it goes down like buying so, ammo you know, from ammo.com you should definitely be doing like, that uh, buying ammo from ammo.com absolutely yeah absolutely and if you have 20 percent a month savings there you go or if you're getting, or if you're getting a, you know, a hundred and fifty dollar check from your power company every month, as opposed to paying for power because you're pumping excess energy into the system, and and I've got a buddy down down near Burt near uh, uh, Montgomery who did just that. He immediately when he designed his solar system, he said fifty percent overage right off the bat, uh, and yeah, he's pumping into the system, and now the power company's paying him. And that is not a bad thing, even though, not even though, thing. you know, we pay, we pay the power company at the retail rate and they only pay us at the wholesale rate, whatever. I'm still getting a check in every month, you know, so they're paying That's me really at this brilliant. point. Yeah. Better than nothing. <laughs> so on the, on the, on the two is one, one is none thing. This is, this is something that I, that we preach a lot around here of, uh, you know, if you're going to do alternate power, have, have a power plan. Actually understand, you know, how much power you're going to, you're going to need, how much power you're producing, you know, and, ha and have that working correctly. And I love solar. I really do. And I love have, I love having grid tied power and that's great too. However, I'm in a spot here where I get a lot of sun, but at the same time, I also get a lot of wind here. I get a, I get at least five miles an hour, about 300 days a year. Wow, and man, wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna bluff overlooking the Tennessee River. I get a nice little breeze blowing, and in in Alabama in in August, believe me, that is a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, August is when I don't get that breeze. But um, having having dual alternate energy systems. So uh, my plan here is solar panels, as well as a couple of vertical axis wind turbines. At the same time, because of course, you know, wind's not blowing 24 hours a day, but solar's not producing 24 hours a day either. So you, you, you've got your battery bank, but you've got the two is one, one is none now. So I've got re redundancies brought to you by the redundant department of redundancy department. <laughs> so that if one goes down, I've still got the others. So, so smart. Yeah. Wind, solar, you know, and of course, 
generators, you know, natural gas, gas, whatever that is, you know, diesel generator, all really cool options. And solar is still so young. It's not the only answer. It's it should be one of the solutions uh, that you look at and consider for sure. It's not it's not for every single setup for sure, but uh, it, it's pretty good. And to have solar and wind and something else is that's the dream for for myself and a lot of people, I'm sure. Oh, definitely. I mean, everybody, everybody wants to have their, like you talk about the bunker in Montana, right? Uh, You know, everybody wants to have their, their bug out location or just their home be that location for them and have that energy independence. So, uh, you know, I teased this a little earlier, but uh, you know, Max, tell us a little bit more about Sundra Energy, what you guys do, what you're about and uh, you know, kind of give us the rundown. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, We are four years old. Um, I've been in solar for 10 years now. Uh, hung up my own shingle four years ago, and a bunch of other people decided to, to come jump on that ship with us, and it, it's been going really, really well. Uh, like I said earlier, we are in 30 states, and we we are not the install side on our side. We have a team uh, that we team up with across those 30 states that is the actual wrench churning panels on the roof. They're good at that, and we're really good at the explanation, education, uh, marketing side. So it wouldn't be Chris Manese and I getting up on the wrench, you know, or on the roof with wrenches for you, but we are the one that bridges that gap because there are, you know, it's, it is more complex for sure the first time you're ever doing it. And right now, fewer than 4% of homes in America that could have solar do have solar. So as we sign up customers to go solar, almost all of them are doing it for the first time ever. So it is not like buying a car or buying a new dishwasher. It's a little bit more complex than that for the average American. I think probably a lot of the viewers today on this program are a lot more self-reliant and capable than most. But we are, of course, dealing with the average American and 50% of them are dumber than that. So we're, we're, you know, we're having to try so hard to educate people, bring them the understanding to what we're doing here and then help them along the process, get the panels on their roof, they start saving money. They've got a backup. And if things go sideways, there's a there's a production guarantee on the panels. There's warranties, manufacturer's guarantees. So we try and take the headache and the what ifs out of it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's it is still a young industry for sure. So we're not in every state quite yet, but I believe there are solar companies in every state. So, you know, take a look around for sure and consider it. And how do we find you? Sunderenergy.com. Sunder. S-U-N-D-E-R from the Old Testament means to break apart, We're trying to you know break apart the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and you can reach out to us there and, and inquire and we can get back to you quickly. We have somebody in all of 30 of those states that can come out to your home if you'd like, or we can or we can just do it over the phone, but we can definitely come and sit at your kitchen table, look at the roof, figure stuff out and come up with a good plan for you. Cool. I was just going to mention that uh, we, we talked about this before the show, but I wanted to bring this up that uh, you guys are actually a veteran owned <laughs> company as well, right? Yeah. We are. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did four years in the army. I was in from 2003 to 2007. I was a tanker on the Abrams tank in the fourth infantry division down at Fort hood. I did two tours in Iraq um, in those early days there, 2003, 2006 kind of time frame, and loved it, man. Probably, you know, who knows? I'm, I got years ahead of me, but that's probably the coolest four years of my life. Of course, hard days for sure, but it definitely, gave me the foundation uh, and an appreciation for this country that I needed that I didn't have as a young man. So it was the coolest four years ever um, and chose to, to chose to not make a career out of it, but uh, definitely respect all those that, that do and, and mad props to the guy the 25, 30 years, very impressive, but love my time and, and uh, happy to be doing this. We've hired a ton of veterans, ton of veterans. We army air force, we even allow Marines in, you know, if we have special exceptions for them, uh, but, <laughs> but it's, it's been awesome. Crayon yeah. rule. Yes. Thank you. Mike knows. Mike knows. Yes. I, uh, these guys are going to be great. Best friends. I can see it already. Definitely. No, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Go for it, Chris. Max, tell us one, one, one story that Mike will bring a smile to Mike's face. One like oh, tanker <clears throat> story. Um, this is not well, like our company call. You're not going to offend anybody, so you can get a little wild here. If you I'll, want. I'll tell one. Yeah, this one's this one's PG-13. It's nothing crazy. No one died, but uh, we. This is the first time I was there, 2003. We got a little bit ahead of the rest of our group, and it wasn't super safe for big trucks full of food to just come drive into where we were, and we got really hungry. 
And we, we all brought some cash with us. We don't even know why, but we had some money with us. And we bought a goat from a young man in Iraq, nice young man. And he, we gave him some money. We picked out a goat. He expertly, quickly slid its throat, skinned it. We were all like flabbergasted, speechless. And then, and then we, we attempted and we did our best there's no, there's no trees. There's no wood. There's no way mm -hmm. to start a fire. So we put it on the, the exhaust rack of the Abrams I was wondering. <laughs> yes. You can cook anything there. You, it's you just you not going to taste can. real good. No, it didn't. We put it in neutral, and I went and gassed it up, and it, it did enough. It was like um, goat tartare a little bit. It was, it was pretty raw, but it hit the spot for sure. It was some protein and some calories, and you know, we, we, we survived. We made it. <clears throat> and that kid made a lot of money. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you guys, if you don't watch the end of the video, you have got to start doing that here because this is where all the good stuff is at, guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I thought you were going to, I thought maybe you're going to blow a building up or you shot some commie uh, from mommy. No, or no, something. we're cooking goats on the, on oh, the no, no, no. That's the, that's the everyday stuff that you do, but just stopping somewhere uh, and going, hey, can I buy that goat? Yeah. yeah that, that's where that's where it gets fun. That's the yeah the weird stuff. That's the and it's not even like Dade City, Florida, farm raised, nurtured. Oh goat. no! Oh no! Iraqi desert walking around. I, yep. I don't even know what these goats eat, but they exist. Okay. So they must be scrub. Drink. Scrub. scrub. Yeah. And 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 Max, you uh, you you spent enough time there. The uh, the new guy on the tank was probably going. What what's gonna happen to the goat? What's gonna happen to the goat? That's I was the new guy, one. Mike. Oh <laughs> goodness! Yeah, oh, and, and so you guy. probably at that point didn't know what has happened to the goat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh, it, yeah, there's yeah. there's some there's sad that. truth to that comment. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so man. yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, you need to roll with more SF teams, man. We were constantly <laughs> buying stuff and and doing exactly that. That's how you living lived. off the land. That's how you lived, man. How That's you cool. lived. No, but it's tar -tar. oh yeah, yeah. Don't cook anything on the back of a tank except shaving water, man. You guys, you guys had it really smart without uh, having the big twenty mil cans that you could that you could heat up water on the back of a on, on the back of that M one's exhaust. I would say probably the funniest thing that I did see in Baghdad in 07, I think it was, this idiot, uh, we're in traffic, driving through, I think it was Adamia or something like that on the north side of the, the Tigris River. And this idiot in a Benz of all things, you know, how many, how many Mercedes do you actually see on the streets of Baghdad? Maybe, maybe, maybe one in a hundred thousand vehicles, something like that. It's, it's almost, it's, it's all Opals and Toyotas. And uh, yeah, this dude pulls up directly behind an M1 sitting there in traffic and and starts honking at the M1. You saw that you saw that commander turn around and look at him, say something in his mic, and it went into neutral and whoop, he started cranking it up. You saw that nice little Mercedes symbol go blur. Oh. <laughs> and just melted all the the all the paint on the front of that car bubbled up. It gets hot. I mean, it is stupid hot. It just blew the paint right off the front oh, of that freaking man. car, man. <clears throat> worth it. I, I believe it. I mean, for totally those who don't know, it's a fifteen hundred horsepower turbine engine. It's yeah. pull. It's like pulling up behind an F sixteen almost. Hey, you're running jet really? fuel in those, aren't you? No. Jet fuel. Wow. Well, yeah. JP eight. JP eight. Yeah. yeah. Jet yeah, fuel okay. for rednecks, maybe. <laughs> Jet fuel light. Yeah, yeah it's it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, those things those things are crazy. And and watching them go watching them go past you at seventy miles an hour, you're like, look, man, something seventy tons should not be able to move that fast. It's it's amazing. Engineers yeah. are incredible people. They're smart. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Guys, if you're looking to get yourself a solar system or get set up, we highly recommend you check out Sunder Energy. The link will be down in the description. Just as a heads up, we are not getting paid for this. This is not an affiliate link. This is going to go direct to their site. If you want to get a hold of them, all their contact information is in there. If you live in the Florida area, you'll probably be talking to Chris. Uh, guys, we, we definitely recommend this company. This great company, veteran-owned. We really appreciate you guys coming on today. 
Uh, as always, if you made it this far in the video, leave us a comment. What are you thinking about for solar solutions or just alternative energy solutions for your either bug in or bug out plan? Let us know down in the comments and we'll catch you on the next one.